Hello and welcome to Ashbourne Baptist Church, to our pre-recorded service that's for Sunday the 28th of June. Uh, it's great to have you listening to this. A very warm welcome to the brothers and sisters of Ashbourne Baptist Church. Uh, it's a shame we can't be together, but uh, we want to all listen to God's word, uh, to worship him as best we can and helped by a recording perhaps like this and uh, opportunities to meet together as well. If you're uh, joining us uh, on our YouTube channel, just watching this and uh, you don't know us and we don't know you, then please get in contact if you want. Uh, it'd be nice to hear from you. And if you've got any questions, please, uh, please do send them our way. Well, we'll uh, begin by just introducing a hymn and then we'll pray together in a moment. Uh, this hymn was written uh, well, uh, well, by a man who was born 400 years ago, a man called Samuel Crossman. And uh, he was uh, as a very early hymn writer, uh, born in Suffolk about 400 years ago. And he became a, a pastor. He ended up pastoring two churches in Sudbury in Suffolk, uh, the Anglican Church and the dissenting Puritan Church at the same time, which was a, a curious thing to be doing. Uh, later on, he became the Dean of Bristol Cathedral and was buried there when he died at the age of 60. Apart from that, we know very little about him at all, about this man, Samuel Crossman, uh, except this hymn that he wrote, My Song is Love Unknown. Um, a lot of it echoes, apparently, an even earlier poem called The Sacrifice that somebody else had written. And it's a very... Um, scriptural hymn based on mostly on Matthew's account of the, the crucifixion and in uh, Matthew 27. And it's a very poignant hymn, isn't it? How it uh, thinks through what the eyewitnesses saw and imagines as, as if we're watching this too. Uh, like in verse three, sometimes they strew his way and his sweet praises sing, resounding all the day, hosannas to their king then crucifies all their breath and for his death they thirst and cry they rise and need will have my dear lord made away a murderer they save the prince of life they slay yet steadfast he to suffering goes that he his foes from thence might free sort of pictures those scenes right at the end of jesus life and yet it's a very personal one isn't it and uh, shows us something of the faith of this man, Samuel Crossman. It begins in verse one, my song is love unknown, my saviour's love to me. Oh, who am I that for my sake, my Lord should take frail flesh and die? He came for me, writes Samuel. And uh, as we join in with it, it's a very personal thing, isn't it, to sing about that love that the Lord Jesus has for, for me, for us. And it finishes in verse six, here might I stay and sing no story so divine. Never was love, dear King, never was grief like thine. This is my friend in whose sweet praise I all my days would gladly spend. And it, uh, he invites us, doesn't he, to join in with that, to sing about our friend the Lord Jesus, the friend of sinners, uh, my friend, and I hope yours, and encourages us to spend our days praising him. So let's come and pray, and then we'll link in a recording for us to sing together. Dear Lord God, our Father in heaven, Lord, we do come before you in the name of our friend, the Lord Jesus Christ, your son, whom you gave to this world to be our saviour. Lord, we come in his name. We thank you for him. Lord, we thank you for that measureless love that we can't begin to comprehend how wide and how high and how deep is that love of the Lord Jesus for us. Oh, who, who am I? Who are we? that for our sake, the Lord Jesus would come and take frail flesh and die. Lord, we thank you for him. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who came into this world to save sinners like us. Lord, we thank you for his life. 
Lord, we thank you for the salvation that he came to give. Lord, we thank you that he went steadfastly through that suffering of that last day of his life as we're thinking about it this morning. Lord, we thank you how steadfast he to suffering goes, that he his foes from thence might free. Lord, we thank you that he went to save us who were his enemies. And Lord, we give you thanks. Lord, we come and confess our sins. Lord, we acknowledge before you our sins in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, even in these last days, even this morning, in these last few hours. Lord, we come and pray that you may cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we thank you for your love, for your enemies like us. And Lord, we pray that you might stir us, that we might want to praise you today, on this your day, even though we can't meet together, Lord, may we be stirred to praise you today. And all our days, Lord, stir in us that uh, we might begin to love you more. And so, Lord, be with us, we ask. Lord, we do ask for your blessing upon Ashbourne Baptist Church and for the folk of the church. Lord, we pray that you may bless each one, those who are struggling at the moment uh, with uh, the lockdown as it drags on. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling, feeling lonely, uh, for those who are feeling stressed, for those who have worries about loved ones, worries about their health. Pray for those who have job worries and financial worries and the like. Lord, so many difficult things going on at the moment. Lord, we do pray that you may bring your peace to our brothers and sisters here in this church. Lord, we pray that you may knit us together with those bonds of love, even though we can't often meet. Lord, we thank you there are some opportunities now to do a little bit of that at least. And uh, Lord, we pray that you may really just join us together with that uh, peace that comes from you, we pray. Lord, give us wisdom in the weeks ahead, especially as elders and deacons who try and make wise decisions in the life of the church. Uh, Lord, uh, help us in that, we pray. Uh, that we might uh, know your guidance in those things we ask in the wise way as we want to meet together. But we also want to be careful and uh, wise and uh, do what is uh, good for not just for us, but for, for visitors, for the local town too. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would give us your wisdom, we pray. Lord, bless our country, Lord. We thank you in your mercy that the, the death rate from COVID has fallen now. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. Lord, we thank you that it doesn't seem to be as bad as people feared. And Lord, that is a token, I think, of your mercy to us. And Lord, we pray that people might not just shrug it off and think, Let's just get on with the summer holidays, but Lord, that there might be a turning to you, we pray. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit, we ask, that perhaps as churches can begin to open in the next month or two, Lord, that there'll be an influx of people seeking after you. Perhaps those who've heard things in various online services like this, but want to find out more, who want to talk to people, to find out that truth about you. Lord, be at work, we ask. And uh, Lord, we do pray that we may use these opportunities, uh, we ask. And so bless us, uh, we pray, Lord, we do pray for your blessing upon all of your people around the world. Lord, we know there's so many difficulties going on. Lord, we do pray that you'd give wisdom to those in authority. We want to pray too for our persecuted brothers and sisters, that you would bless them, we ask as well. Lord, we've experienced just a few months of being unable to meet, of being locked down. And yet there are some for whom that is a pretty permanent thing, who are afraid to meet together with other Christians, who have restrictions on their meetings. Lord, those who are watched, those who live in a measure of fear, Lord, we lift them up before you. Lord, asking that you may have mercy on them, we pray. 
And so, Lord, be good to meet with us, we pray. Lord, may we know that we're meeting with the living God. Lord, may you lift us out of just listening to an electronic recording just in our front rooms. Lord, may we hear from the living God. Lord, may you bless each and every heart, we pray. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. John's Gospel, chapter 18, verses 28 to 40. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas unto the Hall of Judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into this judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring you against this man? 
They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. We'll turn back to John chapter 18 that was read for us uh, just now. And uh, we're going to be looking at this uh, end of this chapter now. End of chapter 18 together now. I'm giving it the title, Lessons for Us from Jesus' Trial. As we look at uh, Jesus' trial before Pilate and the beginnings of the things that happen, there's so many things that uh, we can learn that apply uh, so carefully to us in John's recording of it. The first thing is the leader's sin the leader's sin. John's account now takes us through the last day of Jesus' life. Tells us in verse 28 that Jesus was led from Caiaphas to the Praetorium and it was early morning, probably very early morning. Um, John uh, uses uh, Roman time, uh, we think, and so in chapter 19, verse 14, uh, he says it was the preparation day of the Passover, about the sixth hour when Jesus was sentenced, and uh, that would make it about 6 a.m. in our time as well. Whereas on the other hand, the other gospel writers like Mark, for instance, Mark in chapter 15 and verse 25, tells us that Jesus was crucified about the third hour. Well, that's because he's using Jewish time. And so the third hour roughly means about 9 a.m. And so that's what's going on at this time. And there's Jesus' trial. It's very early. Uh, the trial went on in the night, uh, as we looked at last time. That was illegal, of course, to hold a trial for a capital offence in overnight. Uh, but it seems at the crack of dawn, uh, they then lead Jesus from uh, Caiaphas's house, where the Sanhedrin had had their trial. Not that John tells as much of that. The other writers do and then takes uh, their, uh, Jesus to, to Pilate. Another thing is worth bearing in mind that uh, the gospel writers are of course a little imprecise when it comes to time. It wasn't like John or Mark or any of them had a, a watch in their, on their wrist or a mobile phone in their pocket to check the time with. It's more like us, you know, if you've, you know, you're enjoying a day out or something like that and your phone's tucked away in a bag or something and your other half says, you know, what's the time? And you sort of glance up at the sky and then guess uh, based on what, what, where the sun is perhaps and normally how hungry you're feeling, isn't it? You know? And uh, that's, that's kind of what they're doing, although probably uh, more accurate 
accurately than us because they were used to that. And so when John tells us, you know, he's not meaning it was six o'clock on the dot when they arrived at Pilate's house. John is more saying it was very early in the morning. And when uh, Mark is saying that Jesus was crucified at nine, he doesn't mean nine on the dot, he means mid-morning. Uh, this is what happened uh, to Jesus. And so we don't need to worry too much if we're thinking we've got, we've got too many things to fit in in the Bible in a short space of time. It could easily be a little allowance of an hour either way, really, with those things. Anyway, um, on they head to the Praetorium, we're told, a Roman word for the headquarters of the Roman garrison and the Roman uh, governor, where Pilate would be staying. He didn't stay there all the time. He often lived in Caesarea, but he'd often be in uh, Jerusalem for the, the, the feasts like this. Anyway, they've made their decision already. Uh, well, some time before, in verse 14 of chapter 18, we were reminded of Caiaphas, who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And that's a recap of chapter 11, where the Sanhedrin already met together uh, some uh, maybe months before and decided that they were going to put Jesus to death. It was decided already. And they bring him to Pilate, and in verse 30 they tell Pilate he's an evildoer. And yet Pilate, after examining him, finds that's not true at all. End of verse 38, I find no fault in him at all. It comes down to the crux of the matter in chapter 19, verse 7 where the Jews say to Pilate, we have a law and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Because Jesus claimed to be the son of God and they did not believe him. And so they want to put him to death. That is what's going on here. And so they bring him to Pilate. And there we get into one of these strange sort of ironic things that John describes for us. Did you see it in verse 28? It was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Uh, so they take Jesus uh, to the, the head, headquarters but they won't go into the courtroom or some sort of public venue uh, in, the, in the barracks or something like that. But some people think it's the Antonia Fortress, which was next door to the temple, because they're concerned that they might be defiled. That would prevent them from uh, celebrating the Passover. Again, some people raise a few questions at this point, whether, you know, people, uh, whether the gospel writers are being a bit dodgy um, in describing things inaccurately. And it is a bit strange because Jesus, of course, has had his Passover, hasn't he? And the Passover was meant to happen on Thursday evening, which is what Jesus and his disciples have done. It was meant to be eaten after sunset on Thursday evening. It may be... They were, of course, very busy on Thursday evening, these uh, priests and the Sanhedrin. Uh, they were busy plotting Jesus' arrest. And so maybe they hadn't got round to it yet. And it seems there might have been a little bit of leeway that as long as you had it before sunset on Friday, you're OK. So maybe that's what they're meaning. They want to get this done and dusted. They don't want to be defiled so they can go back and catch up on the Passover they should have really had already. It could also mean, as it sometimes does, after the Passover day came the seven day Feast of Unleavened Bread. And sometimes they call the whole lot the Feast of the Passover. So it may be talking about the days that would follow uh, were also the Feast of Unleavened Bread and these priests and the Sanhedrin, of course, want to participate in that. And so they couldn't go into Pilate's palace or the courtroom or wherever it is in case they got defiled. That's what it says. 
they're worried about the presence of these pagan soldiers and Pilate himself. Maybe there's idols there in the barracks. Maybe there's unclean things, unclean foods that they, the Romans might have eaten. Maybe there are immoral objects or things that they've done in that place. The irony of it, though, they think to themselves, oh, we can't go too near Pilate because Pilate might make us unclean. While at the same time, they're orchestrating the murder of Jesus. And never for a moment think that might make them unclean. Jesus said about them that the Pharisees strain the gnat but swallow the camel, talking of their uncleanness, that they notice the pernickety little things, but, but don't notice the big things. Here they are unjustly lying, perverting the course of justice, murdering an innocent man. Pilate knows, we're told in Matthew, that the whole thing is because they are envious and hate Jesus. That's what's going on in their hearts. And yet they're obsessed with the minor points of whether they're going to become unclean because of the Romans and their barracks or whatever it might be. They forgot the big things. And yet it's not just the leader's sin. I call it the leader's sin and ours. In John's irony, as he portrays the, the fallen state of these people, their sinfulness, it's portrayed for us in a way that resonates, doesn't it? You don't have to look far for accounts of great evil. The murder of this man in America, seemingly, by a policeman who, being videoed, thought he would get away with it? Thought he was above the law, maybe? It's raised all sorts of questions, hasn't it? And some of the demonstrations that have followed about the, the uh, horrific transatlantic slave trade and the like. There are so many, aren't there? History is full of it. Accounts of great evil. But here described for us in John chapter 18 and 19 is the greatest evil the world has ever seen. Because this was the one pure, innocent man. And it shows the depths of depravity of the human race, a despicable evil that the priests and the Sanhedrin should be so filled with hate so envious of Jesus' authority, perhaps his popularity, that they were willing to do anything to put to death the best person who'd ever walked on planet Earth. And yet there's something in it, isn't there? In times of great trouble, in scandals that hit the headlines, in great injustices that come to the surface, in demonstrations and protests, in violence. Many times people think to themselves, what's gone wrong with the world? Long, uh, many years ago, a newspaper ran an article asking that exact same question, what's wrong with the world? And the following day, somebody replied in the letters to the editor, Dear Editor, in reply to your question, what's wrong with the world? I am. Your sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. What's wrong with the world? I am. What's wrong with all of these great evil things that are happening and have happened through history? I am. The human heart's the problem the same heart of evil that's in every one of us. These, the irony here of the actions of the Sanhedrin, <laughs> they're not the only ones. It's their sin 
and Arles. They're not the only one with these illogical um, hypocrisy and the like. Human beings constantly do things like this. They can commit the most heinous crimes and yet have some religious rituals and superstitions, pernickety little lines that they won't cross, things they do think are wrong, whereas they ignore the wrong they're doing. How daft it can be. Remember the comedy film, well, probably of 10, 15 years ago, uh, The Whole Nine Yards. And it looks uh, in a rather comical way at a hitman whose job is to murder people, who's paid to murder people. And yet he's outraged when his wife commits adultery. How illogical is that? How hypocritical is that? And yet, it's not just a funny story, it's the kind of thing human beings are like. They excuse the things they do and then get awfully angry about something else that somebody else does. We can get so obsessed with little details. But Jesus said it's not the external things that make us unclean. Is what comes from the heart. Out of the heart comes unclean thoughts. The priests thought to themselves, if we avoid Pilate's house, we'll be clean. Clean enough to enjoy the Passover. But ignoring the evil from their own heart. And we can be the same, can't we? We can easily point the finger. We can easily think of these little rituals and superstitions we might have and ignore the big matters that Jesus says of love and justice and mercy, obedience to God. Secondly then, Pilate's choice. See what happens in the story as uh, John recounts it for us. So they bring Jesus to Pilate and uh, Pilate comes out, verse 29, what accusation is there against this man? They reply, if he were not a evildoer, we wouldn't have delivered him to you. Maybe Pilate was meant to know already. He had sent some Roman guards to arrest Jesus, so perhaps he's meant to know the case anyway. But uh, he then says to them, verse 31, will you take him and judge him? Sort him yourself. You judge him. It may be even Pilate turning a bit of a blind eye and saying, actually, you know, if you want to kill him, that's fine. Um, I mean, they did, like with the murdering of Stephen, didn't they? They stoned him in the street. But they reply, no, 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 you have to do it because we can't put him to death. And we're told in verse 32, that's signifying the death that Jesus would die. They want Jesus to be crucified. Why they want it, we don't really know. But Jesus, of course, said it was going to happen. Even back in chapter 3 and verse 14, as Moses lifted up the, the serpent in the, in the desert, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. Again, in chapter 12, he said the same. It's all fulfilling this plan of God. The curious thing, though, going back to our previous point, of the, the Jews, the priests, staying outside and refusing to come into the courtroom or whatever it was, is that Pilate then takes Jesus inside, verse 33, to question him. And Pilate has to sort of scuttle to and fro between the priests outside and Jesus inside. And a crowd that's building up in the end outside as well. And, and Pilate seems sort of caught in the middle, sort of tossed between these uh, different people. And so he takes Jesus inside, verse 33. Verse 38, he comes back out and says, I find no fault in him at all. That's probably where you need to sort of patch in Luke's account about him being sent then to Herod, another attempt by Pilate to pass the buck. And then Jesus returns from Pilate and is mocked and scourged. And there's the Barabbas incident that we'll come to later. Then the same thing happens. Then in chapter 19, uh, Pilate uh, comes out with Jesus in verses 4 and 5. Says again, I find no fault in him. Verse 4, 
Then he takes Jesus back inside, verse 9 and 10. Then he brings him back outside again in verse 13 and 14. And Luke has him a third time saying, I find no fault with him. And there Pilate is sort of shuttling in and out between Jesus and this crowd that are building up. What is Pilate going to do? They want to kill Jesus, but they can't. They don't have the authority to do it. Pilate has to decide. And he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to. He says to them, you sort it. And they can't. He sends him to, P to Herod in Luke's gospel, hoping that he'll sort it out, but he doesn't. And so it's back on Pilate's plate. Verse 38, Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. And so he hopes that he can perhaps release Jesus, even though he's innocent, he's gonna release him like a released criminal on early parole for the Passover. And that doesn't work. Pilate then, chapter 19, commands Jesus to be scourged by puni punishment, by scourging, even though he'd done nothing wrong, hoping that somehow this uh, barbaric torture would somehow placate the priests and crowds and perhaps show enough blood and the like uh, to, uh, to make them uh, give up on putting Jesus to death. And Pilate is just trying to, frantically grasping at straws to try and get Jesus set free, but without, without angering the crowd. All in all, Pilate's a pretty loathsome character, isn't he? One of those ones that's infamously gone down in history. He's a coward. He's spineless, isn't he? He hates the Jews and fears them. He knows what is right, and yet he can't muster the courage to do it, to stand uh, by his own convictions. We read somebody like this, a story of Pilate, and we, we loathe him. And yet at the same time, he's so natural, isn't he? So real. So like us. He's not the only one who knows what's right and lacks the courage to do it, is he? <laughs> He's just like me. Is he like you as well? We're afraid of what others might think. We're afraid of losing things that matter to us our position, our money, whatever it might be. We want to protect ourselves. This is Pilate's choice, but it's ours as well. Here in this story, it pictures our situation too. I wonder if you ever sat on the fence, not literally, but in a decision like this, procrastinating and postponing Maybe in this very question, what to do about Jesus. Maybe for some of our young people whose parents are Christians and who come along to church. Maybe others who are brought along to a church by a Christian, but they themselves aren't. Maybe somebody who's listening to this video who's just sitting on the fence, not yet made a decision about Jesus, trying to avoid the decision a bit like Pilate. Think of the questions that Pilate asks and gets asked. Think of verse 33, he asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And uh, Jesus replies, well, that, de that depends what you mean. But the, the implication there is the question, well, do you want me as your king? Am I your king? Uh, Pilate says, I'm not a Jew, and carries on, and so on. Verse 36, Jesus clarifies his kingdom's not of this world. Verse 37, he's a king who's come into this world and been born for this reason, to testify to the truth. And again, implies a question in that. Do you want the truth? 
Pilate, do you want to listen to me, the truth? Pilate's the one who's meant to be doing the questioning, but suddenly he finds himself in the hot seat, in the dock, as Jesus turns the questions to him. And Pilate again dodges, oh, what is truth? And heads straight away outside, it seems, not waiting for any answer. And yet, can we dodge the same questions? Jesus asks us, do you want me as your king? Do you want to listen to me, the one who is the truth? And yet, we can dodge it, can't we? Fudge the answer to that. Not wanting to try and avoid those probing questions of Jesus. Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. He has these remarkable opportunities because of the, the stubborn hypocrisy of the priest staying outside. Pilate has some personal one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. Pilate can take Jesus into his, his inner room and talk with the most remarkable man that's ever lived and ask him questions. And he learns and thinks, it seems, uh, is made to think as he talks to him. And then he heads outside and everyone shouts, crucify him, crucify him, and the like. And you kind of sometimes feel sorry for Pilate, don't you? He's under such pressure. He's convinced and convicted that Jesus is the innocent one. And yet the world are shouting it and the crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate just caves in under the pressure. But he's not the only one. We struggle in the same sort of ways, don't we? We might be convinced, convicted in our hearts that Jesus is the innocent son of God, that he is the king, he is the truth. But when the world shouts, when our friends laugh, when the media make fun of Christians and the like, we can find the pressure too much, can't we? God says in his words, we're created. And the world shouts, now you've evolved from a monkey. And it shouts it so loudly. God tells us his right ways to live in marriage and with with sex and, and all of these things. And the world shouts the, the opposite with its lies, with its temptations. The shouts come to us. It's Pilate's decision and it's ours. Are we going to listen to Jesus, the truth? Are we going to follow him as our King, our Lord and our Saviour? Pilate has an opportunity to nail his colours to the mast. And he doesn't. He caves. But what about us? The time comes, doesn't it, for each of us. Perhaps we can remember times when we sat on the fence and then that moment came. No, no. We need to nail our colours to the mast. We needed to confess our faith in the Lord Jesus and be baptised and, and so on. Or perhaps there's somebody listening to this who needs to do just that. To no longer sit on the fence and procrastinate like Pilate. But to stand up for the truth. Lastly then, Barabbas' escape. The chapter ends with Barabbas. Verse 40. They all cried again saying, no, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. John tells us. Luke and Mark tell us that uh, Barabbas is a prisoner already and he was involved in some sort of rebellion that went on in the city and committed murder. Maybe he was a guerrilla, some sort of freedom fighter or a terrorist. Who knows exactly? Obviously a violent man who'd been at the heart of this rebellion and he'd murdered someone. He'd, he, uh, who knows who that was? Had he murdered a Roman soldier? Had he murdered somebody in the crowd just in the, uh, in the chaos of this uh, violent rebellion that was going on? Who knows? 
what was the robbing that he did? We haven't a clue. Mark tells us that the priests were sort of agitating the crowd, whispering these suggestions in their ears, and so they demanded that uh, Pilate uh, release Barabbas. He refers to the custom in verse 39, you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? There seems to be some sort of strange tradition, maybe linked to the Passover, their release from slavery in Egypt. And uh, there's not, not an awful lot that's told us about it, but it seems that there was this uh, parole scheme that someone could be released, just one, it seems, just one person could be released at the Passover. And Pilate sees this as a, a hopeful opportunity to get Jesus out. And yet they demand Barabbas. As we sang in our hymn, a murderer they save, the prince of life they slay. Again, it shows us, doesn't it, the depraved heart of human beings. We've seen it in the priests, we've seen it in Pilate, we see it here in the crowd. This is the majority view. This is the will of the people. It almost comes across like a democratic vote. And they vote for what is evil. They're given a referendum. Who will they vote for? Well, at least who will shout the loudest. And they vote to put a convicted murderer back on the streets. And to put an innocent man on the cross. Who in their right mind would vote for something like that? The injustice of it. A murderer they save. Who knows who he, who he killed? And yet he goes scot-free. And the prince of life they slay. And yet at the same time, a deeper truth is demonstrated even in this little story, account of Barabbas. Think of Barabbas for a moment. Imagine him in prison. He's a robber, a murderer, a rebel, a lawbreaker, involved in some sort of violent rebellion, and he's the one who's caught. Well, actually, Mark tells us there's others of these rebels in prison too, but he's the ringleader, it seems. He's the one who's, who's been arrested. He's the one whose name everyone knows. Is that because he's popular? Is he a freedom fighter? Or is he one of those infamous criminals who's done something so barbaric that that's why people know his name? Anyway, he's tried and he's convicted fair and square of murder, robbery, and rebellion. And he's sentenced to death. He's on death row. How long he's been there? We don't know. Has he been on death row weeks? We're not sure. Imagine him in prison, chalking the days up on the bricks of the prison wall as he's there on death row. And then one day, the prison guards come along, unlock the doors, they swing them open and say, excuse me, Mr. Barabbas, you're now free to go. Free to go? Can you imagine him asking the guards, what, why, what happened? What happened to my conviction? What happened to my sentencing? Oh, and the guards say to him, well, uh, you can go free. The charges, well, they still stand. You're still a murderer. You're still a robber. You're convicted of all of these things, but you're just not going to be punished for them anymore. You're, you're free to go. What happened? Barabbas might ask. Well, the, the guards might say to Barabbas as he's given his personal effects and let out of the prison. Well, the crowd were given a choice. Pilate, the governor, uh, gave them two people to set free. 
the option of setting free at Passover, you or Jesus? I wonder if Barabbas said, well, who's this Jesus? Well, he's an innocent man. Pilate said there was no charge against him. He'd done nothing wrong. It seems he did good and helped and healed those in need. He was just and kind. He spoke the truth with such authority that thousands of people listened to him. And he loved people. And the crowd were given two options. And they voted to set you free and they voted to crucify Jesus. Interesting to think, what did Pilate think of this? <laughs> did he just wipe his brow and think, whew, that was lucky. Here I am, let out of jail, scot free. Did he go back to his bad old ways? Did he get back involved in another rebellion or go back to worse crimes? Or did he marvel that he had got free, gone free, and Jesus had died? That they traded places? Jesus was the innocent one who should go free. He was the convicted one who should die. And instead they swap. He's the criminal who goes free. And Jesus is the guiltless one who dies. We've no idea. Did Barabbas just head for the hills and get out of Jerusalem? Did he linger and watch the man on the cross who died in his place? Perhaps the very cross he was meant to be crucified on that very afternoon, who knows? Barabbas' escape, and ours, is a picture of that Bible truth of substitution, we call it in the theological language, that there's a swap, that Barabbas is the, the criminal who deserves to die, and Jesus is the innocent one who deserves to be free, and yet they swap. Jesus dies in Barabbas' place, maybe even on Barabbas's cross. And it's a picture of us. For those of us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're like Barabbas. We're those who are convicted fair and square for breaking God's law. He's a murderer, a rebel, a thief. Well, have we been greedy? Well, have we taken anything that wasn't ours? Well, have we been hateful? Have we cursed somebody else, swore against somebody else, hated somebody else in our hearts? Well, Jesus says we're like a murderer then too. We've rebelled against God's laws. We don't like to be told what to do. We do what we want instead. The essence of the things at work in Barabbas' crimes are the same desires that work in me and you. We're convicted fair and square. And those who sin shall die, it says in the Bible. It's appointed for men to die once and then face judgment. All of us deserve punishment. And yet if we're a Christian, then we believe that what was pictured here in the life of Barabbas has happened to us. We are the ones who deserve to die because of our sins. And yet we're the ones who go scot-free. Because Jesus, the innocent one, dies in our place. We, we are swapped over. He is our substitute. He dies for us. We're set free like Barabbas. And Jesus died in our place instead. We have that escape. An escape from punishment. An escape from death. That is separation from God. 
Instead, we're given the opposite. Instead, we're declared innocent. Instead, we're promised heaven. Jesus is our substitute. Barabbas' escape, Anas. Maybe as we've been thinking this evening, in these lessons that are there for us, in Jesus' trial, the hypocrisy that was there in the priests, but is there in us, the indecision, the, uh, the weakness of Pilate that's there in us, and yet the wonder of a sinful man who goes free, Barabbas. And yet that can be us too, that we can go free. We can be forgiven. We can be given life instead of death. We can be given heaven instead of hell. We can be given forgiveness instead of punishment. All because of Jesus, our substitute. And so I hope that's given us something to think about, perhaps for some who are not yet Christians, to realise the sinfulness of their heart, to realise the decision they need to make, to realise the wonder of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for them. Perhaps that you might put your trust in the Lord Jesus even as you listen to this recording and think about it afterwards. That you might trust in Jesus, your substitute. That you might see how you've been set free like Barabbas. And isn't there so much to praise God about? For we are those loveless ones that we were singing about earlier. We're these ones who are so vile, so full of sin. The same things that we see in, in the priests and in Pilate and in Barabbas, we're just the same. And yet we're the ones who've been loved. Loved by the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we do thank you for these words in John's Gospel, written for us by this eyewitness and written for us by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that your word may be given power. Lord, we pray for anyone listening who doesn't know you yet. Lord, that you'd convict their heart of the same sort of hypocrisy and evil that we see here portrayed in this chapter and yet show them the wonder of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for them. And Lord, we, we thank you that though we look here in this chapter and see the utter depravity of human nature, how vile and evil we human beings are, Lord, we thank you for the willingness of the Lord Jesus Christ to go to the cross for us. In my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Lord, we thank you that we have such a saviour who was our substitute, that we can go free. Lord, we praise you for our saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who willingly took our place at the cross. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.